the post neoliberal situation mm -hmm. is this they've been kicking the can down the road using it as a political football the border and immigration policy in other words both parties have for a very long time each had an interest in not resolving that issue keeping it in play keeping it alive and mm -hmm. trump came in and was like oh let's just do this let's have a grand bargain a deal we'll have a guest worker program we'll put up a wall right like i'm just going to give both parties what they say they wanted mm -hmm. right and then both parties were like oh wait we didn't actually want to make a deal we want to keep this going right mm -hmm. and yet they are going to make this deal now why is that because it's not working quite the same way anymore Welcome to the Control Zone. It's that time of the week or time of the month again. Uh, with me today is everyone's favorite track coach, the last Marxist genius, Chris Catrone. Um, we are going to be discussing post neoliberalism because uh, we're two weeks away from uh, the election and it, it looks like we may very well really be entering into a post neoliberal moment if Trump wins, right? And it looks like, according to the polls, of course, when I tell people this, they always say that the polls I'm looking at are all right wing. Uh, but when I look at real clear polling, it looks like Trump is ahead within the margin of error, but nonetheless, he's ahead. Um, so you suggested we talk about post neoliberalism. Um, what, what was it that made you think this would be an opportune moment to bring it up again? Well, I think that, um, you know, eight years into the Trump phenomenon, um, obviously people have been very slow. People in mainstream political discourse, but also people on the left, have been very slow to recognize the significance of Trump. That seemed obvious to me from the beginning. And um, and also to others, like Boris Kagerlitsky, there was an article that we published in the Platypus Review. Um, he had two articles, one on Trump and one on Sanders. And he had a kind of a spurious um, analysis, to my mind, to some, to some degree about industrial capital and finance capital. But anyway, there was this idea that um, Trump represented a different faction of the ruling class. That's one way of thinking about it. And, uh, you know, so I think that people have had various ways of trying to address this. But I was thinking about it more historically, you know. Um, meaning not like this faction versus that faction, because I think those arguments are tenuous at best, um, but rather this historical moment, especially as a historical moment for the millennial, millennial left, like the, the, you know, post great recession, post war on terror. You know, if we think about the things that define Trump, I think that the reason that people have had such a hard time acknowledging it is because the Democrats refuse to countenance it, meaning the Democrats don't want either a new economic nor a new foreign policy. And that's been clear since Obama, right? So post neoliberalism as, you know, using neoliberalism as a kind of a broad category you know, we could also call it post neoconservatism, post evangelical Christianity, something, right? All these things. And, uh, you know, and Bernie and Trump as twin phenomena. I feel like the Democrats refuse to acknowledge that there's anything wrong with their domestic or foreign policy. And they refuse to acknowledge that um, Trump represents something more than himself and the worst of the Republican Party is conventionally understood, that he's like a hyper neoliberal, that he's a hyper social conservative, you know, it's like a hyper Reaganite, you know, an ultra Reaganite, I should say, not hyper, ultra Reaganite, not, not like a meta Reaganite, but like an extreme Reaganite. And, you know, to me, it was obvious that he's not that, and that it was impossible to think of Trump outside of the historical moment. Right. And as a post Obama phenomenon. And so then the question is, well, why were people discontented with Obama? 
because he failed in both economic and foreign policy in a way that he had promised and didn't deliver. It's very straightforward. But people, you know, to this day, you know, like Ben Burgess will say, oh, well, Trump is a warmonger. And it's like, okay, but relative to who and what do you mean? Especially because he really did try to withdraw from all the wars. And we know now that he was sabotaged. Now he's actually sabotaged. And this is the real hostility to Trump at some institutional level. Right. In, in, in 2016, if you watch Trump during the primaries, he did this thing where, on the one hand, he would tell Jeb Bush that um, invading Iraq was a, a, a huge mistake. It was a whopper of a mistake. Um, that and based it, that, on a lie. And I mean, based on a lie. Not only a mistake, it was wrong. Right. And um, it was a stupid mistake. And, that it, and also that George Bush did not protect America from terrorism. In fact, he was defined by his failure to protect the United States from terrorism. What was 9-11 except that failure, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, he, he called the whole system corrupt, and he asked NATO, like, why, why aren't these NATO countries pulling their own weight more and things like that. But at the same time, he would say, you know, if we're going to go into a country, we should get something out of it. Why didn't we steal the oil? Well, yeah, we, transactional. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, he was very bellicose towards Iran. He seemed to be um, willing to fight with China. He was anti-China, had this kind of mixed message on China. But, but, um, and he was barbaric in the way in which he spoke in the, and so direct and uncouth that he seemed like a warmonger. See, to my mind, what's barbaric is Obama. And, uh, you know, that whole, like, smooth way, you know, it's what I cite, you know, Samantha Power saying, you know, we wanted to reform U.S. foreign policy, but then we learned the wisdom of continuity. And that's much more barbaric than anything that Trump could ever say. I agree with you. I agree with that you. That was but clear I'm... to me in 2015. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so it took some of us a little longer because it just because Cause you didn't uh, want to believe uh, <laughs> what did no, I seriously, want to... you didn't want to believe that Trump could be anything but what the Democrats told us. Right. And we had Bernie, right? <laughs> yeah, Bernie. And of course, Bernie, Bernie was a better choice than Trump. Sure. It, it seemed like, and I'm not so sure, but it seemed you know, like it. At least at some level. I mean, you know, sh I mean, I can grant that. What I'd also say is that Bernie would have been less effective. Right. In other words, would Bernie have been able to pull out of the war? I mean, the problem is that Bernie, as an anti war guy, would have had to prove that he's not. Whereas Trump, as someone who's like, shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and bomb whatever, doesn't have to prove to anyone that he's not a weak need liberal, right? And so only yeah. Nixon can go to China, only Trump can pull us out of these wars. Right. No, I, I get it now. And, and, but at the time, he seemed... Hypothetically, of course, Bernie could have been elected, I mean, if the Democrats had let him. That, that, mm -hmm. In other words, not at all. Right. But, you know, I don't think Bernie would have been a bad president. Of course, he would have been a great president. He would have been right. much more competent than most. Right. You know, yeah. obviously. And more competent than Trump. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, right. I, I, but what where I'm at now is I'm looking at Trump uh, through a more real, I think, in a more realistic way. Like, I no longer, like, I think a good litmus test of whether or not you have Trump derangement syndrome is if you can watch Trump at McDonald's and find it charming. Yeah. I think there's nothing there's nothing not charming about it. In other words, like to see it as like sinister, it's like well, of all the things that Trump does, this is the least sinister thing. You know, but like the seething hatred, you know, that people have, they're like he's not wearing a hairnet, he's a walking like health code violation. And it's like, well, actually they don't make the fry cooks wear hairnets, turns out. Right. But anyway, I mean, no, exactly. I mean, I think, I think 
you know, because I'm encountering this a lot in the last year. People who had questions about what Chris Catrone has been saying, and somehow the scales fell from their eyes in the last year. I think it took a Biden administration to convince people. That's a damn shame, because how many, like, okay, four years, four years, like, do you know what I mean? Like, we're, we're wasting world history here. Right. I mean, we could have said eight years ago, you know, Trump's not a fascist and fuck Obama is such a failure and the Democrats are so complacent that they deserve to lose to Trump. And I did say that Trump wasn't a fascist, you know, but it, it's one thing to say he's not a fascist. And it's another thing to really say, you know what, he's not even outside the spectrum of the norm. Like, you right. know, he's only he's rhetorically, another, is he? Only rhetorically in, in terms of style and where he comes from. But really, his politics and I, and are... you know that I love that anyway. I will just say this. I hate the rhetorical norms. You know, you can't have an adulterer president or whatever. Like, I'm sorry. I hate all that shit. I, I actively hate that. The pretense that politicians are morally upstanding, I hate that. I feel like they're all sociopaths. Of course, they're all abusive in all their relationships. Let's just grant that. <laughs> right. Because clearly they are. Right. You know, and it's much better to have one who's openly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. And, and, um, and I think that he, uh, I think, my my motto is if you're going to be if you're going to be aggressive and hostile and manipulative if you're going to do that you should be self-aware about it and maybe let people know <laughs> you know like you no know. i mean the um the what do you call it access hollywood uh, tape the october surprise in 2016 mm -hmm. where trump is actually reflecting on the mm -hmm. fact that being a famous rich person allows him to get away with stuff that's what he was saying. Right. He was saying, it's incredible what I can get away with as a rich celebrity. Right. In other words, it wasn't unreflective. It was extremely no. reflective. Right. No, I know. No. You know? Right. In other words, like he was saying, I'm a pig and it's amazing what I can get away with because I'm rich and famous. Yeah, right. 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 I mean, in other words, he, and he, I don't think that he was saying, you know, all men have a right to do this. Quite the contrary. Right. Right. Did but you, of course, it was twisted the other way. Whereas I, Bill Clinton has to deny to his dying breath that he's yeah. a pig. He has <laughs> to deny to his dying breath that he's a pig. I hate that. Yeah. And aren't we all pigs in some way or another? A little bit. I don't know. As a gay man, pig means all sorts of things. Oh. Right? It's a type. <laughs> you know, I feel like you get into, like, leather or something. No, you know, okay. That, that, yeah, okay. Pig, good kind. Pig, you know? I, I, don't, I don't mean it like that. But, but um, here, I want to show you something. Um, and, and then we should get serious about the politics. Post neoliberalism, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Tell me if you can hear this. Gentle, Donald. Slowly, okay? That's good. How much you want for your pot? 500. 600. Introducing Cozone.com, the place to find computer help and buy what's right for you. Hey. Hey, yourself. Cozone.com. We can help. <laughs> that's so great. All right. no, that's, like <laughs> no, that's exactly on point. <laughs> yeah. No, he plays himself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He plays right? himself. It's like I'm I'm not a pig. I just play one on TV. Actually, I am a pig. <laughs> right. Right. But he, yeah. But there's something a little charming about that. I know that. Very. Right. And check it out, Doug. Look, I don't care about Donald Trump. Meaning, I didn't give a second thought to Trump until he ran for president. 
and then I realized he could win. He could win the nomination and he could win the presidency. And I don't know how many people saw that right, right up front, but I did because I had a sense of the historical moment. I had a sense that, you know, the Democrats were played out. You know, it was a disaster. I mean, look, Obama was a failed president profoundly. Libya, Syria, I mean, Syria, like in other words, like Afghanistan and Iraq were bad, but it turns out it only gets worse. Right. Yeah. You know, so this is the guy who was supposed to fix it. Made it worse. And okay, so that's that. And then the economy, right? So again, in our, in our day, do you remember domestic and foreign policy? Do you remember? I don't know that people don't talk about that anymore. I guess now it's like economics and war policy or something. Right? It's much worse because it's not even foreign policy. It's just war. It's just which war, <laughs> you know? Whereas there was a time when it was foreign policy, meaning as opposed to war, right? And, you know, the two parties would compete, presidential candidates would compete on their domestic and foreign policy programs and the public's, like, credibility regarding, like, okay, who do you think will do better on foreign policy? Who do you think will do better on domestic policy, right? And now, right, I just feel like, okay, it's much more degraded. But, you know, by, by those old criteria that I was raised on, that we were raised on, our generation, George W. Bush and Barack Obama were abject failures in a way that Reagan and Herbert Walker Bush were not. You know, you have to go back to, to Jimmy Carter. Yeah, and it's hard for people on the left to, to hear that second point, right? Um, uh, and this, is, this speaks to the being a post-neoliberal moment, and the really the big thought taboo that you're floating right now. You sent me um, a couple of links to uh, some articles in B business magazines, Business Insider and mm -hmm. uh, MSN.com's Money Market mm -hmm. page. And they're both about how it turns out maybe the, all the people who are saying Biden did a good job are not exactly wrong because in terms of GDP growth, the United States is leading the world. Yep. Um, it's not yep. China. Yep. Um, the dollar is strong, apparently, and yep. it looks like there's going to be uh, another turn and uh, maybe some sort of boom or what counts for a boom. Mm -hmm. after the seven after the 70s you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and so like okay so uh it, it, that could that could be true right that could be the historical moment that the mm -hmm. post neoliberal moment will be a moment where the united states has is kind of refreshed it's morning in america again mm -hmm. you know it's not like all the problems and ways in which there's we're disaffected and will go away it's not like we're going to achieve equality and freedom no. and fraternity no. but just you know in terms of like how it is under capitalist uh rule it could be a, an, a bit of an upturn for a decade or something right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um this is um uh th this is hard for leftists to consider and, and especially someone like myself who kind of came to marx out of the 2008 yeah crisis yeah um but also it's hard for a leftist to consider because to accept that things could improve uh, within the bounds of what how we live our lives now. Can I trace it? Let me trace it to the 1930s. Because I do think that the left has been stuck in, in a mode since the 1930s. And, um, you know, you see it with the anti-fascism, you see it with the popular frontism, you know, you see it with the anti-imperialism, but you see it also in a kind of, you know, like grudging, like inability to countenance that capitalism can be saved. But then, you know, when push comes to shove, you know, okay, well, 
capitalism can't be saved, but you know, we're going to support the progressive capitalists. Right. And there's no sense, there's no sense coming out of the, the legacy of the thirties, the way people understand the thirties, no sense whatsoever that you would support progressive capitalism because it might put capitalism into greater crisis and socialists might be the beneficiaries of that. Right. It's rather this schizophrenia, I think, which is like capitalism can't be any better than it is, but we're going to support the better capitalists who will make things better. You know, and so the millennials just call that socialism. Right. And, um, you know, because as I wrote, you know, um, the Tea Party called Obama a socialist and, and also condemned uh, the mainstream Republicans for being socialists because of the TARP measures in the 2008 crisis. Um, something similar happened with um, Trump and COVID. Right. There was like all this money put out and then uh, the mainstream capitalist press was like, oh, I guess we're all socialists now. You know, because of COVID spending, you know, and I feel like in the left, of course, thought, yes, like, don't make anyone work, m pay everyone to stay home. That's socialism. Like, uh, you know, let's remember that people thought that COVID was going to lead to socialism. So, you know, I've just been on this merry-go-round for my entire life. And so I've seen so many turns. I know how this goes. Right. And so, again, it's like um, we lived in a meantime growing up. Right. So the 70s were rough. The 80s were rough. The 90s uh, boom era seemed thin, seemed superficial, and yet had some substance. They didn't last terribly long. There was dot com bu bubble. There was 9 11 shock recession before the Great Recession. Right? Um, you know, I feel like there was like a window and I missed it because I was like doing other things. I was making art and then I was in graduate school. We were too young to really yeah, feel the 90s as a boom because we didn't have professional careers where right. we were getting ahead. I was in my early twenties during, mm -hmm. the, I was mm -hmm. in my twenties and I was trying to avoid being an adult throughout all of the nineties. So mm -hmm. that I didn't, you know, I didn't feel it, but people would tell me, no, the nineties are an era of, of opulence. Everyone's a consumer. This is no one's on the left anymore in the nineties. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And, and, and the nineties had, you know, definitively disproven Marx economically. You know, also in the shadow of the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, because the Soviet Union supposedly disproved Marxism at the level of economics. Right. Yeah. We were in the information economy. Oh, well, there's that, too. Right. We, right. we didn't need to worry about labor anymore. It was right. post-industrial, you know, which is they've been saying for a long time. It was time. the service economy. It was the information economy. Yeah, it was the post-physical economy, which people are still kicking on about. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, like physical production is male. Mm -hmm. Remember physical infrastructure is male. Oh you know, yeah. You, you, you don't mean coming in the mail. You mean math. -E. Yeah. yeah. -E. You know, um, you know, the care economy, you know, human infrastructure, all this stuff, you know, whereas I just see it as abject exploitation. Um, you know, but, but no, we were sold a bill of goods on all this stuff. So in any case, nonetheless, nonetheless, when the Great Recession did hit, it cast preceding history in a different light. Because in fact, it was worse than the 80s, which were pretty rough. The 80s were rough, but the Great Recession was worse. And it was worse in some ways in the 70s. It was. And in terms of like a generation of unemployment, I know that it hit the 70s hit pretty hard, but it seemed like literally no job prospects for millennials for a good like 10 years or something or some, you know, significant chunk of time. Whereas now they all have jobs and they're all doing well and um, and they will become conservatives. They are becoming conservatives. They will become Republicans as they age like everybody, um, you know. And so in any case, you know, 
I saw the end of an era, um, which I don't think that I was alone in that. But I think that people were kind of slow to say, you know, we're not going to be dealing with neoliberalism anymore. We'll still be dealing with capitalism, but not with neoliberalism. And I think that what the left had done is that they talked themselves into something, which is that somehow the only way capitalism could have been saved after the 60s was neoliberalism. And so neoliberalism ending meant the end of capitalism. And I thought, well, that didn't happen with the Great Depression. It didn't happen in the 70s because people had also said that, that the crisis of Fordism must mean the end of capitalism, that there's no way out. Automation meant the end of capitalism. You know, Andre Gord's farewell to the working class. You know, it turned out not to be true. It's not true. Right. Every time, every time people call it the final uh, crisis, terminal crisis of capitalism, it ain't so. And I know Marxist history enough to know that Marx and Engels thought there was no recovery possible after the 1840s. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. And then when they're writing the Grundrisse too, so there is a recovery. And then there's another like crisis in the late 1850s and, and Marx and Engels are convinced that that's the final crisis. But then they realize, you know, as he's publishing capital and et cetera, but by the 1870s, it was clear that actually, no, there isn't a final crisis. Right. And I think it's hard because, you know, there seem to be so many indicators you know, that, oh, how could capitalism possibly recover? But it has. You know, yeah, you know we're, we're publishing emer Fabio Vicky's Emergency Capitalism. Right. And, and he does seem to think that capitalism is in the terminal decline, yes. that, that there's no way to overcome it. And uh, coming out of the MHI, I'm at odds with that from the start because Kleinman never believed that, and and right. it didn't make it doesn't really follow from my reading of Capital that it would be a terminal decline. the The question is a social political one always. Yes. Like how how much suffering, how much death, how much unemployment, how much conflict are you willing to uh, abide in order to per perpetuate this system as as it is? Um, Turns out there's no uh, limit. Well, unfortunately, it turns out that if you don't have any socialist party or right. political organizing of the working class, there's no limit because right. there's no one to say no. There's like and only that's been some... true for a long time, right? To my mind, yeah, yeah. Obviously, this is one of my crazy theses, if you will. You know, I think mm -hmm. this has been true since uh, World War One, right? Yeah, that is a long time. And it and to think in that time scale, it gets easier as you get older, I think. But um, somehow I knew that, though, I think that the attraction of tr the, the two most controversial things, Trotskyism and the Frankfurt School, was was an awareness of this, meaning, oh, Marxism never did recover. I mean, also the way I understood Stalinism, I didn't think Stalinism was the wrong kind of Marxism. I thought that Stalinism was the liquidation of Marxism. Like just giving giving up the project entirely, um, and you know, uh, I mean that's a deep question because it takes a variety of forms. Um, you could call it like third worldism, Easternism as opposed to Westernism, right? All this crap. No, it's more. It's deeper than that, and um, and of course it's it's so deep that the people who gave up didn't realize that they had given up. The Stalinists. Right. They, they, they thought it was the opposite. They thought that they were advancing and keeping going, but really they had given up. And, um, you know, from the United States perspective, it's easy to say that there had been no serious aspirations to socialism since the 1930s. Right. Um, and then that the 60s was some and the 70s to a certain extent was some kind of renascent aspiration. But it's also easy to see that as spurious, as a kind of pantomime. And then obviously the left that you and I encountered, you know, did not really have a socialist aspiration. 
it was subcultural you know it was con it was complacent in its marginality yeah gen x gen x now the millennials to my mind it was like okay we haven't really seen people believe in socialism since the 60s i thought and that's why i thought it was um a authentic opportunity perhaps although i realized that it was saddled with a lot of history and with few resources to avoid the fate and i did see I mean, certainly by Jacobin and the DSA turn and Bernie Sanders, I did see that they were leaning too much on the 30s. You know, I mean, that was true in the Great Recession period generally, is that there was a kind of leaning on the 30s. And I thought, well, you know, and that seemed to be the sticking point. I think that you and I have talked about that in terms of, you know, what saved capitalism was a Keynesian Fordism or was it World War II? Right. And to my mind, it's like, well, how can you separate those? Meaning it obviously was World War II, but it was also the fact that capitalism was rebuilt in a Keynesian Fordist way after World War II. Right. But, but my, and maybe Dr. Nair thought is, it was, they were able to do that because there had been enough destruction of capital. And that might be true. Day. That might be true. Yeah. Because I don't think, I think the 30s, the New Deal didn't accomplish much. No, not. But, I mean, yeah. it it did after the war after and the when war. America was dominant and there was a consumer society and in the fifties, you know. But in the thirties, it, it was not a, accomplishing anything. But then David Harvey had taught me that all it needed to accomplish was laying the groundwork, and that's the period that we're in now. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not like oh, is Trump going to turn it around? No, it's the groundwork that's being laid. Mm -hmm. Because you don't see the benefits. Like, I was thinking about this before we spoke today about Harvey's condition of postmodernity. That's the one Harvey book that I'm very fond of. It's, it's a very long process. Like, Fordism took a long time. Like, the introduction of the Model A or Model T, I forget which one it hinges on, Model T. And, and Fordism as a full blown system is like, 40 or 50 years practically you know it's like what is it 19 i don't know what is it, when did the model t come it's out early um, you know in other words like ford has this idea but it's a, 1908 yes when the model 1908, t and so 40 years later is when you start to get the payoff 1948 yeah and not even yeah. right then really it's, it's the 50s so we're we're in that we are in that time scale in other words we got to be thinking like that, meaning like neoliberalism didn't pay off for a while. Right. It took from Carter to at least the middle of Clinton, Clinton. for it to kind of. And that's almost 20 viably. years. Yeah. And then, but the thing is, and then that it didn't last very long either. Right. But it if you look what? at it in terms of the cybernetic revolution, the information age automation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That starts in the 60s, and it doesn't right. fully flower until recently. Yeah, that's true. If you think of it just in technological terms, in, rather than in the political economic terms. because but these things are connected, right? So policies affect the implementation of technology. Technological mm -hmm. resources affect policy choices. Yeah. You know, I think right. one of my articles is on, you know, the We Are All Freedmanites Now. I point to the irony that um, Friedman, one of his first jobs as an economist coming mm -hmm. out of World War II, causes him to say, oh, fuck, automation is really going to mess with capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's in the late 40s. And it doesn't really hit until the late 60s. Right. But he's prepared for it. In other words, he's starting to learn the lessons of that He's starting in the late 40s, and then he comes up with his economic gospel that people are like, what the hell are you talking about? And then in the late 60s, it's like, oh, you might have been onto something. But then his policies are only taken up in the 80s. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. And 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 um, and not in their full on their fullness. No. And so, but you see, so this it takes 
a long time. It's a painfully slow because part of what we're dealing with is capitalist politics and yeah. institutional inertia, political inertia. You know, there's a lot of resistance to change and there's a lot of resistance to acknowledging change. You know, people do it before they acknowledge it. Mm hmm. Now, I want to show you something. Look at this. Mm hmm. That's um, a movie still. The movie is Desk Set, starring Katherine Hepburn and uh, Spencer Tracy mm -hmm. from, from 1957. Mm -hmm. It's about gender politics and, and digital, uh, the introduction of the digital, and uh, the way in which the, the introduction of the digital is empowering women. to women, you know? Sure. Um, so, like, Spencer Tracy comes in as sort of like the old-fashioned businessman has to deal with these computers and these women in his office, you know, um, and that's like with their gadgets. Yeah. And that's 1957. Yep. Right. You know, so but yeah, it's going to be 1972 when you get cyber sin in Chile or whatever. Right. Right. And so again, no, these things take a long time. And uh, I mean, look, what was it? The imitation game. Right. Yeah. They were already doing like World War II by computer. The Imitation Game. I. The, um. Oh, that's the that's it's a great. more recent movie, but it's about what actually was going on in at around that time. Yeah. During World War II, you know mm -hmm. that they're already. You know, I think that they're. That's where computing gets started. It's like basically to uh, calculate the uh, war effort. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I mean. So the we think the original of it term like, computer meant so a, 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 a usually a woman who would do calculations. Oh right, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you know? of course, like a person, right? right. Yeah. But like yeah. you know, the transistor-based uh, computers as opposed to the uh, chip-based, right? Because right? chips come much later, and you know they had like the punch cards, they had all that stuff, like programs right. via punch cards, and you know, but th they were doing it. All that we've done is accelerate it. Right. And of course, quantity mm -hmm. becomes quality. OK, Hegelians. But, you know, again, like we think that the stuff is brand new. It ain't. You and I had computers in our schools. Did you? We didn't did. you? We did. Right. We did. Mm -hmm. The trash 80s. Do you remember the yeah. TRS 80s? The the trash 80s. 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went to a, an, <laughs> a, a, a more upscale school. We had an Apple II. Oh, mm. uh, uh, yeah. We had one. And By the like way, I figured out that you're a little bit younger than me because I could vote in 1988 for president. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm 53. And yeah, you're, you're a little bit younger. I'm 54. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I could vote for Dukakis. Ah. Weren't wasn't he the greatest Dukakis? I mean, he was practically a communist, right? I mean, he was the best. He was I, I, uh, I can't even tell you, Doug, whether I did vote. I think I did. I think I got a mail-in ballot. I think I voted from Hampshire College in 1988 for Dukakis because mm -hmm. I just felt obligated out of anti-Reaganism. Yeah. Um, but then I did not vote for Clinton in 1992. I didn't vote. I, did, I didn't vote for Clinton in 92 either and would have voted for Dukakis if I'd been old enough. Um, I liked Dukakis because I was made sick by Reagan's um, Cold War uh, mentality. Me too. It's, no, it, know. I, I really, I really, um, you know, I mean, the Reagan years and the second Cold War were formative for me. Very formative. And, you know, I sympathized with the Cuban officer in Red Dawn. Who is like, you know, this is not the way you put down an insurgency. You know, the Wolverines. And, um, you know, but I sympathized. I sympathized also with the French officer in Battle of Algiers, too. So I don't know what's wrong with me. You know, the guy who's like smoking outside the apartment complex that the French troops blow up to kill the uh, the insurgents. Um, you know, and he's just like, yeah, you know, maybe they are just like we were. We were against the Nazis. Maybe they're against us the way we were against the Nazis. But, you know, I'm going to blow up this building anyway. And, um, you know, I there was something... Right. And uh, so in, in Red Dawn, you know, I was sort of, you know, horrified by the idea of like being in class and having like Soviet paratroopers come down and shoot my history teacher in front of me or whatever. 
you know do you remember the opening scene oh look i <laughs> when i was i do yes when i was um in high school one of my friends was an extra in that scene oh great yeah so like yeah it was filmed in colorado in part right and, oh yeah uh, mm-hmm Oh, check it out. All right. You look pretty cool, though, man. I would say they were way off course. Uh, this is very unusual. You can do something, Mr. Teasdale. So, yeah, no, I remember that. <laughs> I remember so that I was, really well. you know, very counter identified with the U.S. in the Cold War. I was mm -hmm. very anti imperialist. I was very pro Central America, very pro ANC in South Africa. I was into all that shit. I look at it differently now, I do, because I do see the Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and I knew about it at the time, but I saw it as some kind of like, I don't know what, like, tragedy of the human condition or something mm -hmm. you know um i mean i do write about this the the fact that you know the south africans living in new york were like oh yeah you'll never have socialism in the united states because the workers voted for reagan i knew that something was wrong with that right right i knew right. that something was wrong with that that didn't mean i liked reagan right but i knew that there was something wrong with that so mm -hmm. You know, I th what did you think it? Well, what what was wrong with that? I mean, you know now what was wrong with oh, that. writing of writing off the working class. I knew that even though I, you know, had a lot of political opposition to like my immediate family, my extended family, their friends, my parents, uh, friends, the, you know, my 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 friends' parents. You know, um, I definitely grew up in a white working class suburban, very Republican party. The Reagan Republican Party, you know, they would have they would have shifted in the 70s from the Democrats to the Republicans. Right. Um, they would have had some angst about Carter and then happy to vote for Reagan. You know, um, not my immediate parents, though, actually, they didn't like Reagan. But um, but that whole milieu and I, I just hated it. I did. And I counter identified with it. But I also had the sense that you're not going to change society without these people did did the left miss an opportunity when reagan was elected was there an opportunity there was in the morning in america that that working class socialists could have taken advantage of um perhaps i mean i think that certainly like neoliberalism was a missed opportunity in the sense of seeing new possibilities in the new configuration of capitalism rather than trying to fight it off, right? Hold back the tide of history. Um, so, you know, the left being on the defensive, starting in the seventies, really, you know, um, you know, I think there was a more radical sixties moment where people understood, look, there's a problem with existing organized labor. And then in the 70s, there was this idea of like, yeah, there is a problem with existing organized labor, but first we have to defend it before we can reform it. That's what people think now. But then when organized labor was clearly defeated and also a lot of like union members voted for Reagan, it should have been clear, oh, maybe the task is to reorganize labor on a different basis. And the fact that the existing labor unions are in the pocket of the Democratic Party is n not only a problem re regarding the Democrats, it's a problem with these unions, too. Right? And I think that that's, you know, in other words, the task is daunting. 
right? But it's like they, they it's almost like this. You, you look back at the 30s left, you look back at the 60s and 70s left. They talked a good game. You know, they had all sorts of aspirations. But when it came down to it, they shrunk from it. Meaning they were intimidated by the magnitude of the task. And so they could say anything. They could say the Teflon president, the B-movie actor, Reagan. You know, but really the task, and this is very similar to Trump. They dismiss Trump. And they do that in a way that allows them to avoid just how daunting the task actually is. Right? And then they blame Trump. And then, you know, it becomes about trying to keep the Democrats from conceding to Trumpism or something. And, you know, like it just gets very turned around as opposed to look, the Democrats were played out, Obama. So why are you even looking there? Well, because, I mean, they did get Biden. They got Biden in. But that, was, but that has been such a fiasco, not just in terms of his governance, but also in terms of his political campaigning this time around. I mean, you just think about I, I, I could get distracted by this, but so because there's another thing I want to say. So I'm going to I'm going to table that a liberal president. He is. He is a what? A post neoliberal president. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, he's a post neoliberal president. And that's worth that's worth underscoring. And I'm going to not, you know, rant about. Uh, how Kamala got the nomination, all that stuff, which is I could go down that road. But which what is, I'll say, in, which is so obvious, though, right? I know. It's just and like, yet we're just supposed to not nothing to see here, folks. Right. I it just. I mean, look, we are living through a time of complete denial, double speak, double think, memory holing. It's very Orwellian. It's very Brave New World. And all I can say is, I'm pretty sure it's going to just be a few years from now when people are going to be saying what I'm saying. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I'm optimistic and I think you're right. I mean, look, I think it's already the case that people, that you can say things now, even as things are being attempted to be memory hold and suppressed, that three, four, five years ago you could not say. Right, that's true. But again, you it's know? a Biden. Yeah, it took Biden. It didn't even take the Kamala, like the Biden fiasco, the Kamala candidacy, because that's the other thing that I'll just say ahead of, you know, the election. If Kamala loses, everyone's going to be saying, what were we thinking choosing this woman? It's going to be so obvious in a way that Hillary was not a mistaken candidate the way Kamala just is. Right. Right. No, I mean, look, you know, it's just clear you know like and and hillary was was lame too but i like like i like kamala more than i like hillary clinton i i mean as a person i kind of speaks in favor of hillary though right should we like these politicians no probably not but i can relate to kamala i can figure i can see myself like oh yeah how would you handle being put into this position where you have to... Oh, well, there's that, where you have to scramble. You have to make the you best... Have, you have no answer for any... Of, the reality is so absurd, and you're just supposed to stand up and talk about joy and and deny... See, I find it creepy. I find it hard to identify with that because I find it creepy. In other words, there's a shamelessness at work, and it's not Biden. It's not Biden, actually, but it's the Biden administration. There was an utter shamelessness to it all that was not the same with Trump. It was not, right? In other words, people think, oh, Trump's like this malignant narcissist, shameless, and, you know, like just post-fact, post-truth, whatever. And but, but the Biden administration has been stunning, I mean, from COVID on, you know, obviously the immigration thing, that they just do things and then completely deny what's happening could like completely deny no everything's working exactly as planned and if it's not it's trump's fault in other words if covid measures are a fiasco well we wouldn't have had covid if it wasn't for trump which is clearly not true but i think people some people believe that i think that the liberal like democrats do believe that somehow trump could have if if it, if hillary had been in office somehow trump uh, covid would not have hit us which is just incredible because like Europe, I mean, just everywhere, China, everything, you know, like 
you know, it just, you know, <laughs> but they, they do think that it, the, the diehard Democrats, right? And so I, for me, it's like, okay, so what are people in denial about, really? They're in denial about this new historical situation that we're in. That's what they're in denial about. And, you know, so I was watching or listening to the New York Times podcast, Ezra Klein. Huh. And he's like, what's really wrong with Trump? Is it that he's too old? No, it's that he's too uninhibited. And what he said was, oh, you know, actually, that might have been good in his first term. Maybe we needed Trump to be uninhibited to get certain things done. Maybe we did need tariffs on China. Maybe we did need to get out of these wars, right? But the problem now is that Trump is surrounded not by people who will temper his uninhibited nature, like he had in his first term, but people who are going to encourage it. And they have an agenda. They want to do things that are really bad, right? And J.D. Vance becomes the villain, right? becomes the villain it's project 2025 and all this crap but what's interesting to me about all of that is that there's a grudging admission that maybe trump was necessary but not anymore like maybe we did need that first trump term but not anymore in other words there's an acknowledgement that oh yes actually trumpism did carry forward under biden and will carry forward under kamala and that's why we don't need trump anymore and that's a Die hard Democrat hates, hates, hates Trump, hates like total Trump derangement syndrome, but just pinching himself and saying, you know, actually, yeah, maybe Trump was useful. Well, the other day I tweeted out, tell me, I think I think this might have been misguided. Maybe I'm maybe I'm backtracking a little bit, but I tweeted out the task for socialists after November 5th, if Trump wins, is to figure out a way to oppose Trump without supporting the Democrats. That was the task in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, which, which, by the way, the DSA people thought they were doing, right? They Kind of. I know. They, they, tried, to, they tried to soft pedal the anti-Trumpism. They did. I will give them that. Right? I'll give them that. The DSA people tried to soft pedal it. They saw the danger of just being anti-Trump. But they also couldn't help themselves because their recruitment was based on anti-Trump. So the Jacobin people who were there before, they knew this was a trap, anti-Trumpism. They certainly knew that. But again, okay, so the way that I would put it vis-a-vis -vis your tweet or your ex post is we don't have to oppose Trump at all. We don't have to oppose Biden at all or Kamala. Like, this is not about opposing. Opposing what, exactly? Like, uh, opposing what and how? So, you know, like, in other words, it's not like, oh, socialists should have opposed the open border policy. Or socialists should have opposed the, the building of the wall, even. Because it's like, we can have in our opinions about these things, but we're in no position to do a damn thing about it. Either way. We, we had no power to stop the wall from being built, no power to stop the border from being opened in a haphazard, irresponsible way. Right. Yeah. I, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not about like, okay, we need to oppose Trump, but not in a way that helps the Democrats. We actually have to do things that aren't about opposing these people either. Right. We have to do something that's independent. Because once we start opposing, then we start depending. Right. No, I, I agree. I mean, I tweeted that out and I thought, hmm. But, but if the, I put the way some things that way back, back in 2016, you know, I did. Um, maybe less in my writings than in some of my public speaking. Um, you know, something like, okay, well, Democrats seem to be opposing Trump from the right in various ways. And the obvious one being foreign policy, including Russia, by the way. You know, in other words, oh, what's wrong with Trump is that he's not bellicose enough towards Russia. And it's like, you know, Trump's Russia policy may or may not be good or bad or whatever, but to say he should be more bellicose, it's like, well, that's clearly a right-wing opposition to Trump. And that is what they hung it on 
right? The whole Russia collusion hoax. I mean, they, I mean, it was all about that. And, you know, I write about this, that the, the New York Times editor um, made a choice, I think in 2018, moving from Russia to race. And of course, the editorial policy of the New York Times was going to be moving from opposing Trump on Russia to moving uh, to uh, opposing Trump on race. Because the Russia thing had played out. Right. Um, I forget when the Mueller report came out. Right. That's when they decided they were like, okay, this isn't going to go anywhere. So we need to move from Russia to race. And it was explicit in the 1619 project was the flagship. It was a centerpiece of that. Very deliberate, very deliberate. Right. But I mean, you know, but okay. But just think about that for a moment. Let's everyone just sit and think about that in order to oppose Trump on race, they had to, claim and make an attack on the American Revolution and the United States as a country. That's that's what how they chose to go after Trump. Yep. You know, and that's and that's the New York Times. That's yep. not some that's not the North Star or Cosmonaut. No. That is the New York Times. <clears throat> like what what is that about? Because they were like, yeah, Trump is some kind of, you know, make America great again. So we have to say America is not great. I mean, they said that already in 2016. They said America is great already. And they said America was never great. And the reason America was never great is that it's always been struggling to realize these ideals, but never, never fulfilling them. And, you know, American history is very Howard Zinn. American history is about the failure. It's about the struggle, but it's really about the failure. And why were they talking that way? Because everyone was disappointed with Obama. Like, and the disappointment with Obama became explicit when Trump was elected because it was understood. Everyone understood that Trump beat Hillary, yes, but really represented the rejection of Obama. And so it's like a black man replaced by a white man. And I said it at the time. It's like the Democrats thought we will never have another straight white male president. Like now that we had Obama, it's got to be women and gays. It can't, you can't go back to the straight white men. And that if we do have a straight white man, then there's something wrong with America. Well, I don't know why they would think that, but I mean, I do. I understand. It's their whole I understand the logic. It's their whole politics since the 60s. It's been their whole politics, meaning after the Great Society, the Democrats have not represented anything but this. Starting with Mm -hmm. McGovern, they have not represented anything but this. Right. Which is a racial politics, racial, politics, racial, sexual, sexual politics and uh, uh, of identity and division, I think. Um, It is. I know that sounds sounds like a right wing talking talking point. point. Yeah, but it is. And, you know, so, um, you know, we were talking about this before we started, Um, you know, the, uh, you know, how issues on the left divide the left. And I mean, I've obviously experienced that throughout my life, but also I've seen it happen with the millennial left. And, um, you know, I see it happening potentially yet again. It's one of the things that people went after us for, like James Smith on the Palestine issue that, you know, he said, oh, you guys are seeing it as just a repeat of BLM. And it's like, well, I'm not sure that we're seeing it that way, but maybe you see it that way, right? And then you're saying, oh no, but it isn't. And it's like, actually, it's pretty much because like with BLM, it's gonna be used to divide people. Right, and to ultimately crazily support the Democrats. Yeah, because it reinforces the whole Democratic Party model of politics. In other words, it basically says to be a leftist, you have to be like the Democrats. Right. Right. I want to show you this. I want to you were you're talking about how the Democrats uh, saw the defeat of Hillary Clinton as a defeat of Barack Obama as well. And it made me think of this comedic video from 2016 from a thing called place boying. I showed it to 
to David Shields the other day, and I, I want to show it to you as well and just see what you think of it. Um, so I know I'm doing this a lot lately. All right, here we go. <laughs> Because I think that people saw it as backlash, racial backlash. Um, you know, I mean, it's very weird. It's all very weird also because the birtherism is seen as evidence of uh, Trump's racism. And people forget that actually Hillary invented that. Right. So I don't know why Hillary being elected is in racial backlash. Right. Well, I... Yeah. When I saw that in 2016, I laughed. I thought it was great, but I also thought, "Oh, I should feel guilty for liking that," you know, because it's a that's clearly a pro-Trump video in in some way. Um, but I think it captures something, you know. It does. No, it does. <laughs> I mean, so you know, I mean, it's. I think people need to snap out of it. Like, you know, I'll just use a Thaddeus Stevens, you know, disenthrall yourself from the slave power, you know, like, uh, you know, the Democrats, you know, like people really need to profoundly snap out of it. It's not like the Democrats are a little bit left and we need to be more left. No, <clears throat> like we got to throw that completely out the window. And that's been true for a long time. You know, um, that's been true since FDR, in fact. So, again, the whole point of progressive capitalism is not the left in terms of socialism. It's a flavor of the right. And, um, you know, in Europe, I guess, they, you know, because they have, like, more organized working class movement and they have these socialist and social democratic parties, I think that, you know, that's a trope also from our generation. The idea that, Oh, well, of course, there's no left in the United States, but there is in Europe. Right. And of course, from my perspective, no, I do think that the Labour Party in the UK, which, by the way, has sent people to, to knock on doors for the Democrats. Um, and uh, no, it is absolutely true. And why wouldn't it be? In other words, it's the global Democratic Party. So after World War II, the US did, in fact, remake social democracy on the basis of the new deal well can russia send people over to knock on doors for trump i mean what what, what why can the labor party do it and not you know what i mean like um is that not international interference by a foreign power in the election i don't know no, i don't know what the rules are it's are inviting it right um you know in other words can they hire non-citizens to work for the campaign of course they can right Right. Yeah. You know, it would be more scandalous if Trump had North Koreans or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, 
uh, the, the, some of the people sent to you to fight in Ukraine by Kim Jong Un were diverted to go knock on doors for Trump in Philadelphia <laughs> yeah. to help get out the black vote. Yeah, that would um, be good. Yeah, the, uh, the original Afro Asiatic black man. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, I I totally agree with you about breaking from the Democrats, but there's. You know, like when I said, well, we need to oppose Trump, we're going to be, be needing to oppose Trump without supporting Democrats. That wasn't right. I don't think you're, uh, that was right in this moment. I think that it was it's more that we're going to need to find out from working people what we should be helping them oppose and what we should be helping them build. I think especially in 2020 and in 2024. I mean, I said this already about 2016. But, you know, working class people who vote for Trump are not lost to the struggle for socialism. They really are not. You know, and so it goes back to my earliest sense of, you know, no, the workers who voted for Reagan do not disprove the possibility of the struggle for socialism at all. In no way whatsoever. And the working class voting for the Democrats might actually give a greater indication of the difficulty of organizing for socialism, right? Because, because maybe the workers think that socialism is the Democrats and that's what they want. They do. They do, but we, we you know, we want to redefine socialism. Right. You know, and, um, you know, we do want to key into the libertarian streak mm -hmm. that is alive and well among the people who are not immediately part of the NGO industrial complex, mm -hmm. right? The people who are not, you know, immediately in the, uh, you know, ambit of academia. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, the people who are not worried about, oh, if Trump's elected, it means I can't get a job with the federal government. Whereas if yeah. Trump's elected, I could get a job with the federal government as a consultant or an advisor or, something yeah we should you know what we, we've been going for about an hour i think that's actually a good amount of time for this half but let's talk about what the what might happen if trump wins and and what what kinds of things we should expect and and support and what what we might oppose or think we might oppose in the trump era in the next half so i'm gonna end the recording here If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.